Did you know that a significant part of our energy consumption goes to overcome the losses in flows? This happens in transportation, as well as in oil or gas pipelines, in pumps, and also in your blood flow. But what are flow losses, and how can they be reduced? Don't worry, a few minutes and you'll get to know. Let's start with the basics. Do you want to stream a gas or liquid? We'll call them in short, fluids, or want to move bodies in a fluid, then you'll need some energy. This is the flow loss. Since energy, or work, is the product of force and displacement, moving a fluid always needs a force, as well as moving a body in fluids. Displacement can be varied. Goods delivered to the store or water flowing from a reservoir to our homes. The resistance force is harder to define. For example, a streamlined or a bulky bluff body moving in the fluid are not the same. On bluff bodies, a shape resistance arises from the pressure difference between the front and the back of the body. On the other hand, on a streamlined body, the friction from the shear forces will be dominant. They develop parallel with the surface of the body. In this video, we'll focus only on streamlined bodies. Shear forces were measured first by Isaac Newton. He poured various fluids between two flat plates. Then he fixed one of the plates while moving the other at a constant speed and measured the force. He found that the higher the velocity, the larger the force. And moving the plates somewhat apart reduced the force. In other words, the force was proportional to the velocity changes of the fluid and he called this characteristic viscosity. High viscosity fluids, like honey, are hard to move. But if the viscosity is lower, the movement will be easier, as in the case of water. This is Newton's viscosity law, and gases and liquids behaving this way are called Newtonian fluids. Nowadays, we also know of other fluids that behave in totally different ways. These are called, what a surprise, non-Newtonians, and we made another clip about them. Now let's see how we can reduce the flow resistance of aerodynamic bodies. Based on Newton's viscosity law, reducing the flow velocity or increasing the cross-sectional area of the flow or changing the fluid itself does the trick. The first method is commonly used, but it isn't worth it to slow down the flow below a limit. Since the fluid usually cannot be changed, the only thing that remains is to choose a larger cross-section, such as a wider pipe. It's all about money. Another question is, what can we do if the fluid does not flow in a pipe but around a body? Vehicles are good examples of this. But before examining this topic, let's see what a boundary layer is. If you squat down on a windy mountaintop, you feel the winds less. Why? Because the air doesn't move on the ground. But higher, as on a lookout tower, the wind speeds will also be higher. The zone of sharp velocity changes is the boundary layer, and it always develops along the surface of solid bodies immersed in flowing fluids. The boundary layer is thin when the flow meets a body, then it grows thicker due to the shear forces. This reduces the sharp velocity changes in the layer and, according to Newton's viscosity law, reduces the local friction. This is why long cargo ships are more effective. The longer the ship, the smaller its flow resistance per unit length. But if the boundary layer reaches a critical thickness, the flow suddenly changes. A sublayer is born, where the drag of the surface cannot be directly felt but the change of velocity remains. Why is this a problem? Because speed difference is always a kind of energy source. Here, however, nothing absorbs this energy. So instability waves develop in the laminar flow, then grow as they travel downstream and finally break apart. Thereby, the flow becomes chaotic. The flow is now turbulent. Its swirling is completely unordered. Richard Feynman, 
Nobel laureate physicist called this phenomenon the hardest problem of everyday physics. Even Heisenberg attempted to solve this problem in his PhD thesis, but he failed. Later, after attending lectures of Niels Bohr, he specialized in quantum electrodynamics and finally got the Nobel Prize for his results. But why is this chaotic swirling flow a problem in terms of flow losses? The answer is quite simple. The chaotic swirling enhances the mixing of the fluid, and the mix of slower and faster fluid layers increases the mean velocity along the surface. So the changes become sharper here, and this will also increase the resistance, as we've seen before. So what can we do? How could the flow resistance be reduced? The first option is to alter the vortices of the flow. The mixing can be prevented with microscopic riblets on the wall. This trick reduces the drag on the fastest sea predators, sharks, and speeds them up. But a surface like this is expensive and hard to clean. So shark skin was solely sports gear for top athletes, until it was banned. A second way is to attenuate the vortices. Vortices may be reduced, for example, by long-chained polymer additives. So less mixing will occur in the fluid, and the flow resistance drops. At the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline, flow losses were halved using this method. The third option is preventing or delaying the onset of turbulence in the boundary layer. This is the approach we are dealing with at the Hydrodynamic Systems Department of the University of Technology in Budapest. We are investigating two different options. The first method is to modify the boundary layer with artificial vortices. At first, strong vortices are generated and aligned with the flow. Thereby, the boundary layer can be thickened or made thinner at some points. Usually, this would increase the flow loss, but with properly sized and shaped vortices, the growth of instability waves can be attenuated and the development of turbulence prevented. After all, the final flow resistance will be significantly less. In our other method, the surface is coated with flexible attenuating structures which absorb the energy of instability waves and slow down their development. If we use these methods, a lot of energy can be saved when moving things, goods, or fluids. And this, in return, saves our environment. <laughs>